Go for it. Oh, yeah. Four pre-rolls for a very special email episode. A very special sponsor, Mad Rabbit, committed to reinventing tattoo aftercare. I am one of the 1.5 million tattoos that Mad Rabbit's helped preserve. I'm wearing Mad Rabbit right now. Uh, here's an exclusive offer just for our listeners. Go to madrabbit.com slash JRVP. Use the code JRVP to receive 25% off. That's 25% off at madrabbit.com slash JRVP. Promo code JRVP helps your tattoos heal and preserve them. Thune is a, a product that's a bed frame. Create that feeling of checking into your favorite boutique hotel suite, but at home with The Bed by Thuma. Uh, now go to thuma.com slash JRVP to receive a $25 credit towards your purchase of The Bed, plus free shipping in the continental U.S. Go to thuma.com slash JRVP. That's T-H-U-M-A dot com slash JRVP for a $25 credit. Thuma. It's a Thuma. Okay. <laughs> I said it wrong off the top, but I fixed it, Thuma. I love you. You'll hear more about them later. So many podcasts out right now. It takes a team of them to bring them together. Whether you're hiring for a podcast or growing your business, one place makes it easy. ZipRecruiter. Try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash JRVP. Nice and to the point. You know what else is nice and to the point? Black Buffalo. If you love dipping just without the actual tobacco, leaf, or stem, Black Buffalo is for you. They even have nicotine-free options called Zero. Head to blackbuffalo.com and use the promo code JRVP at checkout for 25% off your first order. That's the best offer you'll find. Code JRVP for 25% off your first order at blackbuffalo.com. Four pre-rolls and a whole lot of emails coming up, Anthony, on episode 176 of the Jesselnick and Rosenthal Vanity Project. JRVP. Junior Vice President. Give me a ticket for an aeroplane. Ain't got time to take a fast train. Lonely days are gone. I'm a-going home. My baby just wrote me a letter. Uh, that's right. Every once in a while, uh, Santa Claus comes early and he drops a present for all the JRVP listeners in the land. It's the email episode. A.K.A. one of us is going out of town for a week. <laughs> and... Email corner, but extended. Mm -hmm. I think it's part of one of the most fun parts of the show. Maybe one day we don't do headlines at all. Maybe one headline. Whoa. And then don't waste everybody's time. I like the headlines. I do too. I, I'm with you. They, there's a little more variance uh, than maybe the other parts of the show. There's like high highs and low lows. Exactly. That, that's that's life. But I think us just talking and answering questions, consistent laughs. My uh, my mom always loves the email episodes the best. I don't mm -hmm. know why that is, but shout out to Debbie. Gonna What's see up, you Debbie? soon. Uh, let's just ju 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 jump right into it. All right. Gonna see you soon, Debbie. Uh, Steph asks, Steph was a multi, uh, I think she got an email into our last question. It's the same, I mean, our last episode, one, 175. Uh, and she's getting one here. She says about a year ago that her boyfriend of 18 years decided he wanted to be with a mutual friend of ours who just uh, had gotten divorced and they ended up getting married. Okay. And a few weeks ago, a friend of mine, uh, Steph says, who works in HR where he works, told me that he hasn't changed his in case of emergency contact and that if something happens to him, she wants to ask, am I obligated to help this shithead out? What do you think? No fucking way. No way. But ethically, you can't be like, yeah, I'll be right there and then hang up the phone. What you can do is stay as his emergency contact just to get updates on how bad his life is going. <laughs> you know, if something happens, if he gets stabbed by the, his new wife and, and then work calls you or someone calls you up about it, then you get to know and say, sorry, wrong number. Like, I just got this number. Don't say, like, you, they, they think they have a phone number and a name. Say, yeah, it's my phone, but that's not me. And they'll just hang up and call someone else or, you know, call the police. If they don't get your emergency contact, they don't let you die. 
You don't have to worry about that, but you can't say, yeah, I'll be right there. Yeah, but this is, it, okay, I guess the question is, like, if something happens, am I obligated to help? Um, I would just say, well, first of all, I'm a little worried about the friend that works in HR and is uh, giving up uh, privileged information. Yeah. Red flag. Um, I would just tell, I don't know, I guess you it would be calling that friend out, but I would... I would say, hey, take me off uh, your your emergency contact. No, I'm saying don't do that because you want to know. You want to be the first one to hear when something bad goes down. But uh, when does it ever pop up? I mean, when has your emergency contact been contacted? Never. I I, I've listed you before, although I don't think I do anymore. I, I did initially when I moved to L.A. And then Emika was like, you know what? Uh, Evan lives closer and uh, he's a family man. He's, you know, he's. He's used to taking care of three kids. He's only like a 10-minute drive to our house. Let's uh, let's replace Anthony with yeah. Evan. He doesn't have a job. I'm out of town a lot of the time. <laughs> I mean, I'd probably just be like, thank you for telling me uh, wrong number. You know, I want to know, but I'm not going to really do anything. Like, what would I do? What would you do if you got one from me? If it's like Anthony's you unconscious. Go, you go to the hospital or whatever. That's what you do. But like, what if I'm, I'm at a hotel. I'm, they can't wake me up. I'm passed out. They call you first. Are you just, like, do you say take him to the hospital? I'll be right there. Or you just wait until I mean, they're going to do whatever they do. But I, yeah, I, uh, I immediately go into super friend mode. Uh, this is where I really, where you really get uh, the value out of me. I get in that car, I start driving, and I'm going to get shit done. If I were her, I'd be like, you know what? He always said, he was a Christian scientist. I don't know if you knew that, but he doesn't want any medicine. Let him die. <laughs> Plus, I think it totally matters that. Um, you were together for 18 years and then you broke up uh, to be with a mutual friend of theirs. Like, I mean, I'm not saying these are bad people. Shit happens. People change. Uh, but I, I don't need to be part of that dude's life anymore. They're not bad. But yeah, she shouldn't want to be part of his life. Maybe he's a good guy, but you shouldn't have to do anything to do with him. Or you could think about it as he gets hurt. You're like, okay, I'll be right there. Show up at the hospital. They're like, are you the wife? Yes, I am. Just lie. Walk into the hospital room. Be holding his hand. When the new wife walks in, you can just be like, we don't need you anymore. <laughs> That's an option. Have fun with it. Okay. She's not going to give him CPR. They're not going to do that to her. I just think, I mean, it, it does make you think about uh, your emergency contacts, I suppose. Like when your life changes, has anyone ever updated their emergency contacts? No. But it's like uh, your will. A lot of people don't update uh, their their wills after things happen and then just like shit gets messy after the fact. So uh, be nice and update your emergency contacts. Go go through every single um, institution that you had to fill that out for. Like uh, yeah, and make it me. Change it to me. Do you want you want to be in? Uh huh. Because we have to fill that out every year. Uh, you know, at school, you know, at, at the school system for the kids. And I, we list like three people, three or four people. I think you're on the list. You're just like lower. Yeah, I don't think it's an honor. I don't think it's a slight if I'm not. Like if there's no one around, if we lived in like Kabumpuk. It's like a somewhere. little bit of a slight. It's like a, some sort of judgments being made that this person could could uh, spring into action a little And do what? Quicker. They're doing shit. You just have to like tell the family or something. Well, you're just going to eat something crunchy during the show? So just like, just like, hey, we know, I, hey, we're just uh, mailing this one in. I'm crunching away. We got a lot of emails. We're taping two shows. I need a little snack. Okay. Uh, next question's from Brian in Denver. He says, Anthony, I love your comedy. I'm also a big fan of Mark Marin. From what I can tell, you seem to be decent friends. Can you tell a story about uh, Mark being a total asshole. There's a second part of the email, but I'll save that for that. I mean, Mark's always been a total asshole. Like, that's why I, that's why we get along is because I love it when he's a total asshole. And I'm ready for that. Like, I'm not like, what does he think of me? Like, we became friends because I would go up to say hi to him at like a festival and he'd be like, he'd be like, kind of give me like a skeptical look. And I'd be like, what, what is it? And he's like, I'm just trying to see what's coming at me. You know, we always think someone's going to like ask him for something or like, I want to be in your podcast or whatever. And I was just like, we're fucking friends, Mark. I'm coming to say hi to my friend. And I like yell at him. I yelled at him several times, like, we're friends, when he tries to pull that shit, and he gives it up. But he's always an asshole. It's hilarious. My favorite, my favorite, <laughs> we were at uh, South by Southwest years ago. It's like a bunch of different comics, and a lot of them were, I think he was doing uh, WTF Live. 
WTF is Mark Maron's like insanely uh, successful podcast where he interviews comics and goes in depth. Where when it first started, every comic wanted to be on it. Now it's like comedians, actors. He's had the president on, uh, the good one, and uh, and it was like it was comics coming on and it legitimized you. So a lot of young comics like really wanted to get on, even though you didn't have much to say. Nobody cared when you're like been doing it for five years. But this one girl. Uh, is like I was even surprised she was on the lineup at South by Southwest for the comedians and during the WTF she's one of the people and everyone just goes up and for 10 minutes he kind of talks to you a little bit it's not nearly as in depth as WTF but still seemed like a big deal and this girl goes out like in the middle and she sits down and she's all excited she's like fired up that she got this and she sits down and he goes says her name and he's like so you've been begging you've been begging and I finally had you on the podcast what's up and I, she's so deflated. She's uh, like, oh, um, well, like, didn't think this was how it's going to go at all. And I loved it. I thought it was hilarious. Yeah, and you, so the fact that I find stuff like that funny, like, we're just, uh, we're just friends. He like, knows he can be himself. And I'm you like, like assholes. I think it's great. It's partly why we get along. So, you I've, know, got a, I've got a little sneaky asshole buried deep within. You know what's the <laughs> dirtiest part of the human body? <laughs> what? The <laughs> asshole. <laughs> Uh, Brian from Denver also says, by the way, Greg, you're a lot better looking than I imagined, so congrats. So wow. shout out to uh, Brian and our YouTube listeners. That's awesome, man. Congrats. Um, he also says, remember that time the Broncos with Tebow beat the Steelers in the playoffs? Embarrassing for you. Let's you know, ride, he says. I've done so many interviews where that's come up, and it gets cut out every time, or they tell me I can't say it. And that's the watching Tim Tebow beat the Steelers in a, in a playoff game in overtime I felt like Hitler watching Jesse Owens at the Olympics. <laughs> it was like everything, everything that I'm against, like every value that I have just going right down the toilet. <laughs> uh, Leonard Katz asks, with your recent praise from I Kanye. Said that, I said that to Rich Eisen on his show. Yes. And he, the look on his face, he yes. just fell. And they're like, we're going to have to take that out. But I, yes, I remember you telling me that story because that joke you, you just said, yeah, sounded familiar. But that was so long ago. So that long was ago. that was at our old NFL media building. That was right when I was starting out, actually, mm -hmm. uh, like nine years ago or something. That is hilarious. I've worked it into many <laughs> interviews, and they just they never use it. I could just imagine his reaction too. Like he gave you a polite laugh. He probably thought it was funny, but he just knew he couldn't. Um, yeah, laugh and just okay. Uh, he was like, I'm not going to challenge you we're on gonna, this. I'm not going to make it worse. Just like, out. I'm going to, yeah. We're gonna take I, this I had no problem with it. <laughs> uh, Leonard Katz asks, with your recent praise from Kanye, I was reminded of a lyric from the intro to his classic 2010 album, My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy. The lyric is, uh, me found bravery in my bravado. I was wondering if you felt similarly. Has your onstage persona made you a more confident person in your day-to-day -day life, or was it your personality that led to your persona? I like this question, Leonard. Uh, I go with the first one. I think the, you, you put on the persona. It's fake it till you make it. And then as you start to pull it off, like a, confidence is just believing that other people believe you. You know, hmm. people just acting normal with how you're acting. That Yeah, I think that's just normal with age. However you act, people start treating you a certain way, and then you just believe it. Well, I totally disagree with uh, you saying that the onstage persona made you a more confident person. I, I've known you since we were a freshman year of college. You absolutely had a persona then. I was confident, but now I'm more confident. Like, I'm adult like, confident. Okay, no, I get it, but yeah. I just think the germ of um, your bravado started well before I ever knew you. Like, you didn't know you were going to be a stand-up comic, but you kind of carried yourself uh, like you were a character, at least, like that people were going to remember. And that character had similarities to your onstage persona. Yeah, it was just the way to have the most it was fun like, in life. But yeah, I wasn't like, always I'm like gonna that. Be, I'm going to be... Uh, I'm going to be funny, and I'm going to be unapologetic, and I'm going to kind of, like, be a dick a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's funny to be dick, but that's still like a decision I made. And the more it worked out for me, the more confident I got. Okay. I, I wasn't like, I wasn't for me, like I wasn't and... a decision. It was just growing up in Massachusetts. Everyone's a dick. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that. I just thought that's uh, how people are. And, and now I just realized uh, there's a bunch of dicks. I would watch movies and TV shows and the people that I liked, the characters I liked the most were the guys that were dicks, but like yeah, funny too. about it. Me too. I like villains that were funny. Yeah, me too. Uh, Those were my dads. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, you're, yeah, your dad's the opposite of you. Although, 
I gotta say, he's he's a character too. I don't know if he put on the character, but he's got a certain sort of bravado. Now it's a very nice bravado, uh, but when you meet Tony Jeselnik, uh, there's something to it that he's like he's almost a character in a show, and the show is his life. But he he's like a little larger than life to me. Yeah, but in a nice way. So maybe he's you great. learned it from him. Is my my point? I think everyone does it to, to a certain. No, extent. but I mean he really does it, and you really do it. Yeah, you do it a little. He does in the way he's like, almost like he's going to work, and it's like he's almost like the the maitre d at a restaurant. You know, yeah. he kind of turns it on a little more, and it's like it's 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 still who he is, it's but charm. he's charm. Yeah, he's he's putting the effort in. Uh, our next question, I, I really like this one. It's from Joe. She says she's been dating uh, her boyfriend for a year and a half. He considers himself a big music fan, and we've always listened to music together on our very frequent road trips, just like me and you, Anthony. All hmm. the pavement and. Pavement. Dinosaur, Liz Fair. Dinosaur Jr. Ugh. There was a lot of like Far Side and mm -hmm. Wu Tang Clan and a lot of like. Things I liked? Yeah, late 90s rap. Uh, she says, I've always appreciated JR JRVP's music and book recommendations. Realized while listening to the podcast, my boyfriend has never played a single song by a female artist, not once. I confirmed this when I pointed it out to him and looked through his Spotify. When I told him how weird I thought that was, he just kind of shrugged it off. Now I joke about how, quote, he hates women every time we put music on in the car. But it actually is upsetting to me. I'm not trying to be the stereotypical psycho girlfriend, but I feel like maybe it's an indicator of some weird, deep-rooted misogyny. I want to know if you guys think it's as weird as I do love Joe. Now, you were excited about this one. Yeah. Uh, what? What? Uh, you go first. I think, it's a, it. I think it's a huge indicator. I think it's really? a problem. Really? Yeah. That's interesting because I like, I mean, I thought about this and I, I don't listen to a lot of female artists. I think the last female uh, musical artist I, ha I've, I have on my phone is Wet Leg. And I love Wet Leg, but I don't like, there's not a lot that grabs me out there. Like, I, it, trust me, I, there have been some great albums. You've recommended things to me. Yeah, but this Angel guy doesn't, he hasn't, he's never played a single song. In her, like when she's been around in your Spotify. Like They've your, been together for a year and a half. But the, and he looked through the Spotify. But most of my stuff is is guys. You're just, saying most, but that's like what eighty percent, ninety percent. Yeah, I, I can see. I, I can, can see think of women that you you like. Yeah, yeah, yeahs. Um, sure, but when's the last time I listened to the yeah, yeah, yeahs? You should. You know, but like most of the writers I, I read are female writers, not through right. design. It's just that's okay. how it shakes out. That I don't think you're a misogynist if you don't have. Uh, women artists and you're like if there's a f woman in the band does that make it like less bad it doesn't it's just what you're listening to unless he's like a huge if he's a music critic then yeah that's fucking weird but if he's just a guy listening I to music I think it's weird uh, but I like how you brought up the books because that that's a if if this is extending into other pop culture mediums and I guess books would be the only logical uh one that would connect but if he only reads male uh, authors uh, i think so i mean i could see it i i think there's thing. something to it i think um i've learned uh, at work because you know i and you i guess you you kind of pick and choose who you interact with but i, I work at like a big company you, you don't have a choice of mm -hmm. who you interact with totally and i i realized uh, a lot of people do hate women um <laughs> And they don't really like totally admit it, and they would never think that. Uh, but they're exactly the type of guys who never listen to uh, uh, a woman uh, artist or read a woman book, or and it's somehow deep within, or like watch uh, women's sports ever or anything like that. I would think if you're, I mean, I don't watch a lot of women's sports, but I don't think that's that says anything about me. I think that, like it could be a weird thing. It's like, are you complaining about it? Are you mad that women's watch sports Serena. is a thing? Are you mad about uh, people giving Serena attention? Are you mad about the WNBA? Yes. Then that's weird. That's what I mean. If you just don't care, then you don't care. That's, that's what I mean. But it's a, there's a certain sort of guys that always make a joke where they think that if someone is into uh, a female artist or or likes female sports, of like that they're almost trying to like show other people that mm -hmm. they like it. It's like, it's, no. It's a hack joke. Uh, but, but it's I, not a hack joke. It's a sign, too, that, that there's yeah. something wrong. I, I, if, you're, if he's trashing Fergie or whatever all the time, that's weird. But if he just doesn't care, then he doesn't care. Watch I, out, Joe. But try to work some... Watch out, Joe. Try to work some Dixie Chicks into his, uh, into his music. Or the Chicks. I'm sorry. No disrespect. And now it's time for... Ad Coffee. Thuma is uh, really important because Thuma. it makes bed frames. You know how important uh, 
bed frames are in uh, your life? One as, of the most important older. things. It's right up there with the mattress. I mean, it's part of your life. It's each and every uh, day. I'll it's, say a good one can make your bedroom look look expensive, and a bad one can make your bedroom look like a fucking dorm. Right. You don't want to, first of all, struggle to put it together. Uh, Thuma makes that very easy on top Thuma. of their uh, free shipping. But more importantly, your bedroom deserves like a refresh. Mm -hmm. You know? You want to feel like you're at a boutique hotel. You want good bones in there. Now is the t perfect time to like elevate the most important room of your house with Duma. You go to boutique boutique hotels. Fuck yeah, and I try and I design my or I put my place together to make it seem like a really nice hotel. So I get really? this. Oh yeah. I want it to be like the best hotel I could be in on the road. So Thuma is uh, handcrafted from eco-friendly, high-quality, upcycled wood. Uh, and there's all sorts of different variations in the grain. It's a minimalist design uh, featuring Japanese joinery. Uh, it helps elevate any space. It's the perfect bed frame. Um, and it just got better. You can customize it, choosing between original pillow board or the new solid wood headboard. There's different options. Fabric wood uh, pillow board adds softness and, and color. Uh, it attaches directly to the bed, uh, again, using that Japanese joinery. No tools required. You don't have to put it all together like that. You buy it uh, with the bed or on its own as an upgrade. How about that? Sounds amazing. I mean, it... it it is kind of like a sneaky, great way to make uh, your living space just feel uh, more special. Uh, something you're more excited to come home to. It's a less is more design philosophy for the bedroom. Clean lines, subtle curves. It's a way to get laid. Be like, hey, have you seen my Thuma? Get, get them in your bedroom by any means necessary. Thuma is the way. Thuma's not weird. Create that feeling of checking into your favorite boutique hotel but at home with the bed by Thuma. Now go to Thuma.com slash, oh, rather, Thuma.co, C-O, slash J-R-V-P to receive a $25 credit toward your purchase of the bed plus free shipping in the continental U.S. Go to Thuma.co slash J-R-V-P. Again, that's T-H-U-M-A dot C-O slash J-R-V-P. For a twenty-five dollar credit. Thuma. Thuma.com dot co slash JRVP. Mad Rabbit, you know I love it. You know I'm using it. Just got a tattoo uh, a couple weeks back and uh, was excited to try out the product. I almost got a tattoo just to try out my Mad Rabbit. That's how excited I was That's about smart. the Mad Rabbit. You don't need to get it, just have it gotten a tattoo to try out Mad Rabbit. You can put it on your existing tattoos to make them shine. That's a great point. Uh, but I do just love the fresh tattoo. You know, you, you, you look at the other tattoos and you think, I want them all to be that uh, vibrant and fresh. And the way you keep it fresh is with Mad Rabbit. The tattoo bomb revitalizes, replenishes, and proactively preserves tattoo ink. As Anthony said, it's effective on both new and old tattoos, all sorts of uh, skin types. They make it out of natural ingredients. I could go into it. Shea butter, cocoa butter, beeswax, sweet almond, lavender, frankincense, cucumber. That's it. Forget the days of ingredients you can't pronounce with Mad Rabbit. You know what you're putting on your body. It's truly all natural. I got the, uh, I think the vanilla. Yeah, we got the vanilla. Uh, smell Smells great. They became a carbon neutral company in April 2021. Uh, so they believe in leaving the world uh, a little better than uh, they found it. And uh, like I said, I've been using it. My tattoo looks great. It's an important part right after you get the tattoo. Uh, but also use it on your old tattoos because uh, that, that's something uh, new, new people getting tattoos have to learn. Like you do not want that stuff to fade. Uh, you want to use uh, Mad Rabbit and uh, preserve it. Mm -hmm. When you think tattoo care, think Mad Rabbit. They've preserved over 1.5 million tattoos. Right now they've got an exclusive offer for the Jesselnik and Rosenthal Vanity Project Jeremy. listeners. Junior Vice President. <laughs> if you go to madrabbit.com slash JRVP, that's where you use the promo code JRVP. You get 25% off. That's 25% off when you head to madrabbit.com slash JRVP. Use the promo code JRVP. We are going back to the emails here. I'm excited about this next one. Uh, it's a suggestion, Anthony, for a new segment on the show where listeners listen. And that was. Ad copy. Ooh. The whole like uh, email show's got you know mm -hmm. 
Cut me off. No one's mad. No one's mad, buddy. Okay. Keep going. Would Anthony entertain a new segment where listeners list their favorite joke of his? And then he gives a little background on how it got written. And he, he says my vote uh, goes to the Mikey masturbation joke. Okay. Um, I've heard that. I've listened to that one recently because it was uh, put up on my TikTok. I'm sure I'll listen to it again when I, uh, when I uh, go through that special. I think that was on Thoughts and Prayers, I believe. Um, yeah, I, uh, I wrote the joke. The, the, the joke is like a two-parter where um, people hit, my neighbors hate my brother. I opened up the door the other day, caught him masturbating. Uh, he said, shut the door. And I said, get inside. And that was like, that was the joke for a while. That was all of it. And I thought it was funny. It's, it's silly. I like a good silly one. I'm trying to think how I, how I came to it, if I built it backwards. Um, I think I was thinking of jokes of having someone, catching someone masturbating. I was trying to think of jokes of catching someone masturbating. I think I, for a while I was trying to make one work that was like my mom caught me masturbating yesterday with a net. And I like couldn't get that to work. You, like, <laughs> you know, we catch you with the net, like... Imagine someone like yeah. throwing a net I mean, over you like while you're second. masturbating. It's For bad. some reason, I heard it too as the name Annette. Mm. Yeah. Annette Benning? I mean, it just when I hear the Annette, that's I just think name, and then I have to think, oh wait, you know, it's Annette, and then you know, mm -hmm. that was that was what your audience was thinking as it was clunking. Yeah, it clunked. It clunked hard. <laughs> I think I may have tried it a couple of times at like open mics or something, <laughs> and it never worked. Uh, then I came up with that one. It is funny though. I mean. Uh, it should work. I yeah. Wish it Once did. I was like, okay, what if my, even my neighbors hate him? I was like, okay, I'm setting it up. I'm dropping that little like, okay, the neighbors are involved. He could be outside, but that twist. And then I did, I was doing theaters at the time. So I've been doing the joke for a while. And I did the Vic Theater in Chicago. And my brother came backstage afterwards and he was like, he was a little trashed. He'd been at, like my, he would come to the show with his friends and they'd all have like a party that night. And he's pretty wasted. And I'm like, what'd you, like, I, you know, mentioned you in a joke. What'd you think? And he goes, you know, the crowd seemed to think it was funny, but I thought it was kind of weird that you want to fuck me. And I was like, <laughs> oh my God, like, why do you think that I want to fuck you in that joke? And, <laughs> and no one thought, like the joke did great. No one ever thought this, that I was like wanting to fuck my brother. And I was like, Mikey, that's like, that's not what the joke is. You know, I think you're my brother. You're masturbating outside my house. And he's like, yeah. And you're like, get back inside. And I like, it made me laugh so hard that he would even put those together. <laughs> That I immediately started. I think I had two shows that night. And I think I did it in the second show. And that killed so hard. And I never stopped doing it. And that became like the biggest part of the joke. There was just like was a happy him accident. saying that. Yeah. yeah but we, yeah, it was me adding that to the end. Yeah. People just loved hearing it. Even, I remember Jimmy Carr was like, yeah, I love that joke. He's like, the first part's whatever. And I was like, I thought the first part was great. That was hard to put together. And he's like, but that second part with your brother is amazing. And I was like, all right. I guess that's the, uh, the best part of the joke. And now he's really in the joke. Mm -hmm. and, and you have a killer Mikey Jesselnik impression. Like, almost no one listening to this knows it, uh, but Anthony fucking nailed that Mike, Mikey Jesselnik impression. He knows. I always, I always make fun of him at every show he comes to, <laughs> and I'm trying to find out what to do for this next one because like, why, the last why'd time... everyone think you want to fuck me? The, the last time... That is a good impression. <laughs> the last time I did a show in Chicago that he came to, uh, he, was, he was like, take it easy on me tonight. I've got a date tonight. It's, a, it's our first date. And I was like, okay. And so I like, th I'm thinking of this and I go on stage and I'm like, my brother's here tonight. I usually make fun of him. And he told me to take it easy on him tonight because he's on a first date. And I said, don't worry, Mike. Uh, I'll wait until you're with a girl you really give a shit about. <laughs> Place goes crazy. And now uh, that's his wife. Wow. That was their first date. And I got to think of a good joke for when they both come to the show next time. I got to make sure that's our last date. We'll see. <laughs> uh, next one. Um... I don't know who this one's from. I hate when I, I don't have it. But uh, it's a question for you that you've been curious for a while. If Greg wants to get involved, it'd be fun for uh, me to answer as well. Uh, the question is, what goes through your mind while you're waiting for everyone to stop laughing at a punchline? It's like a little, it's a little boredom, a little impatience. I mean, I love it. Trust me, I love it, but I truly don't know what to do. It took me years just to figure out like what to do with your hands. You're just sitting there. You can't start talking until it dies down. I'm just like, come on. Like, and I, I don't want it to stop earlier, but I truly don't know what to do. So I'm kind of bored and a little impatient. So you're not, it doesn't give you, doesn't it give you uh, some adrenaline or a juice of course. or whatever? Of course, but I still, do, I can't do anything in that moment. I have to just stand there and I don't, it's, it's, I don't like just standing there. And it feels weird. bathing it in? 
if I just like went back and like basked in it, then like that would be doing something. But how many times can but you But aren't do you that? thinking of your next joke? What's next? Mm -hmm. I kind of know what it is. And I'll have a lot of it. If the joke gets like a really big laugh, I'll usually have something to say uh, at the end that like keeps it going. Get my last special. They like laugh really hard at something. I'm like, guys, this is going to take forever. Right. It's like, and I'm so bored in that moment that I have to think of something just to say for something to do. But I, I love it, but I'm, I'm not like, I'm not enjoying it. Yeah, I never, I never thought about that. I wouldn't have had a, a good guess at all, but I'd like the question. Our next question is from Kai. Uh, he asks, if you could pick one specific entertainment media for the rest of your life, what do you pick? Uh, in parentheses, Greg can only watch football for work. Thanks. I mean, we didn't need to play this out, and you know, uh, but but I'm allowed to watch football still mm -hmm. uh, for work. Uh, movies, TV shows, books, music, or sports. Oh, I didn't even think about the sports. Isn't wouldn't that be television? Right. Could you uh, watch any sports on television? Well, he's saying he's separating sports and TV shows because my answer was uh, obviously books. Mm -hmm. Well, it's. Man, losing music for the rest of your life stuff too. I don't know why I was so sure of his books. I'm already questioning myself. So you can't hear music for the rest of your life? Like if you pick books, do you go deaf? Like what is... I mean, this is, it's a hypothetical that sure. doesn't it t totally make sense. Uh, but, but you can't like consume it in your home? Or like if you walk by someone playing music, you still hear music. You're not going to hear any music, I don't think. It's just somehow going to be blocked off to you. You're not going to watch any TV shows. You're not going to watch any movies. You're not going to listen to any music. I, apparently, uh, you're not going to watch any sports. Ooh, that's a tough one. But I get football for work, so that kind of fits my Jones. Fuck you. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm going books. I didn't pick this question for the first part of it. And it's obviously oh. books. Because books, like, if you want, like, maybe TV, you'd miss TV, you'd miss movies. But those shit, that shit would make you go crazy if that's all you had. Books, you have such a huge breadth. You could read uh, books about sports, books about music. Then you're getting it. You could read music books and hear the notes in your head. I, I hear you, and books is my choice. It, it gives me uh, a calm, and it, you know, you can keep your mind active, uh, in a way that none of these others, at least for me, would be able to do. But no music for the rest of your life is a killer. I mean, that was the thing I missed almost more than anything in the pandemic was not seeing live music. So not only are you taking away live music, you're just taking away music. Like if you ever, have you ever met someone that's like, I don't really like music. Like, yeah, or what do you like? They're super weird. So people, That's I don't, what I, I don't, mean. I don't like. So it's just like sort of a. Yeah. Even though I'm not a, a musician and I don't consider myself like a huge music guy compared to average, to take that out of your life is almost taking a piece of your soul. That maybe maybe it's dangerous to get rid of music. I heard this great new song. Uh, Read the next part of the question. <laughs> All right, this train wreck of a podcast makes me want to hear every second and even check the video to see your stupid faces. Uh, that's right, we're, uh, we're on YouTube. You can go check Anthony's uh, page there for all our videos. Uh, Kai says, I love your podcast. I hope you become rich and buy bidets. Also, what's Anthony's view on bidets? I would love to hear him completely obliterate this topic from Toronto, uh, soon BC. Hate this place. Keep me going. Kai. Yeah, I want to talk about bidets. I, I'll admit this. I don't really know how they work. I don't really understand bidets. I've never used one like successfully. I think I've sat on a bidet. I don't even know if you're supposed to sit. Are you supposed to like crouch over it? I don't know. I think I've tried it like maybe two or three times in my entire life drunk. I didn't see one until I was like in my 20s. And, uh, and I don't really know how they work. I know they have those ones now that like go over your toilets. It's supposed to be great. They, they advertise on podcasts. I would love one. I love the idea of it. I love the, what do you mean it goes say, over your... It's like a seat you put over that goes oh, over your yeah. toilet and you like sit on that. Um, I would love one. I would love to not have toilet paper anymore, but I'm afraid to not use toilet paper anymore. I like, don't I, I, don't it, I don't know if I trust it. I don't know if it totally it. replaces toilet it paper. It does. It does. I think it just Like a adds... Japanese toilet sounds, sounds great, but I don't know like what buttons do you hit? Am I really... Did I really do a good job here? You know what I mean? I don't know. There's no way to I don't totally have, I don't know. have confidence I think... in it. You know, like I've been in a lot of Japanese bathrooms. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I stay at the in-laws, they have the that style toilet. Mm -hmm. They all still have toilet paper there. I think you still got to, like, uh, use it afterwards. Sure. You'd have to have it for guests or something. It's not like no, you, you got to use but... it in case there's anything left over. I, I, but I think it's like it's a water situation. 
And then it cleans. That's your clean. Yeah. That's and then there's the a dryer idea. situation. Well, right. There's different variations. Do you, I don't understand. There's toilet paper just for drying afterwards. That seems weird. That seems kind of productive. I don't know. I don't understand. I never. I would them. love to be educated. I would love to have one in my home one day. I thought about getting it during the pandemic because I didn't want to be dealing with the toilet paper shit. But I'm just one guy. Uh, I'm not using a ton of toilet paper. Um, yeah, but your shits are just like messy. Mm-hmm. It's messy because I don't use the toilet paper. You know, I uh, never used the ones in Japan. I, I think I might have tried it like once, but I'm always I I'm, I would be more anxious of like which buttons is it if I press the wrong button is it just like well that's gonna reading be a manual that's it, reading a manual it's like sure work amazingly at the NFL uh, network when they open the new offices across from SoFi Stadium they're all Japanese style toilets and oh, they're awesome. all heated. Uh, which is great, and they're automatic and stuff, but um, I don't know. I, I still don't use the bidet function. It's the future. I would love to know. I don't, I don't use it either. I'm not knocking it. I just, I just don't know anything about it, and I want to, and I, it's a major insecurity. I wouldn't use it if I was around it, but if I like watched a video that was like, here's your bidet thing, here's how you use it, I'd be like, okay, let me try it. But I wouldn't leave the house after I used it the first couple times. I'd be like, let me hang out and see if I'm like, see if I'm... Uh, I'm a little stinky, you know, if I'm a little, if Just I got, if I got some mud butt, not, not, yeah, mm. not for like night, the, the whole night, but just like stay home and like, wait, I wouldn't just like use it and then run out to the gym. But like the, what, like the ones at NFL network too, it's the automatic flushes and everything. And I've noticed like those fucking toilets are messier than most toilets. I wouldn't, so I wouldn't use all a this technology bidet. and all this like automatic stuff. And I, I don't know whose that is. I don't know who no. that is. It's probably like some Hall of Fame running backs, uh, little particles of shit that's stuck on the side of the toilet. It's not an upgrade, yeah. ultimately. I, yeah, I don't want to use... I want use, the old style. I don't want to use uh, toilets like that. I also avoid... I my own bidet. Right. I, do you, do you, I avoid, if at all possible, using public toilets for, for number two. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying, people people are taking dumps at work all the time, and I, oh, yeah. I, I make that pretty rare. Listen, I mean that that is it's just shitting on company time is amazing because it's like you're, you're getting paid to shit. It's great. Yeah, I get I, it. If you drink a lot of coffee, I don't I don't look forward to it, but it happens. And I don't I haven't worked in a building in 20 years. What do I know? Okay. Uh, our next question asks: Since you guys are t- uh, book influencers, this is from Tyler. If a published comp publishing company reached out to either of you would be open to doing narration for an audiobook would you be more likely to say yes if an author you enjoyed reached out personally i mean obviously yes that sounds amazing okay here's why it's not and there's two there's two more questions to this here's why it's not amazing okay okay i once volunteered to read an audiobook for a book called uh the comedians by cliff nesteroff i'm sure i recommend on the podcast it's a great book it's a nonfiction like history of stand-up comedy which is an american art form uh that started as an american art form from the beginnings all the way to like maybe the 80s and then it kind of ends but i love the book so much i was like i would read this and I know the author a little bit. And he was like, that would be amazing. I think I emailed him and was like, I would, re- I would read this. And he told the company, Audible or whoever it was, they got in touch. And it, when I saw the contract of how long it takes, you're in, a, you're in a recording booth for eight hours reading. Where not is it just like, it's, you're not just using your voice, but you've got to use your brain and like spell, keep the pace. That I was like, this would drive me crazy. I would be in tears within hours. And then you've got to do like days How long of was the book? Eight hours or something? May, uh, it may have been eight hours, but they had me for like eight hour days for a couple of weeks. And I just thought, there's no way. Damn. I would just be pissed doing it. Uh, it's an honor to be asked for sure. It's cool. They want your voice like that, but it's just so much. I mean, you, yeah, that, you got to be paid fairly. It was, it was it. a lot of money, but it wasn't, a, it wasn't like enough that I wanted to do that. It just sounded like fucking Chinese water torture. I don't know if that's a slur. Is that Aaron? Is that cool? Oh yeah. Cool. I uh, I think I would enjoy it because it would only be something that you like, so it'd be like rereading it, except reading it out loud. Like I read I read out loud to my children. Yeah, but if, but this is reading for like everyone, so everything's got to be perfect. It's you true. mispronounce one word, you stutter, you got to go back, and that would just that would drive me nuts. By the way, oh, um, I the comedians is fifteen hours long. Oh, yeah. okay, so that's a that's a longish one. Yeah, 
It's just even think of, think of for a day being in a recording booth reading where someone's watching you read and telling you when you fucked up. It's a lot. It's I would, true. When, it's not, it doesn't sound fun. It's like when I know it, when I'm reading at bedtime and uh, Walker wants me to read to him and I see that his bedtime's not for another 45 to 50 minutes, I'm like, ooh, I got to really sort of steal myself with some stamina. That's where you need some quality books and not... Uh, that's a piece of trash. Okay, let's say, look, I'm going to ask you this, because I know what I got offered to Tales do that book. Tales of a fourth grader or whatever. Let's say 16 hours, 16 hour book. How much per hour do you need to get paid to make it worth it? If how you much divide it up like that. Per hour? Yeah, if you for 60, or not how, much, how many hours you're there, but for hours of the book, like a 16 hour book. Let's make it a 10 hour book. How much money do you need to make it worth your while? 10 grand? An hour? No. 10 grand for the whole thing. Total. 15 grand, maybe. 15, 15 grand for the whole thing. Yeah. So that's like, that's. If it's a book I hundred. like, yeah. What does it matter if you like it or not? I mean, if it's because bigger words. Because you're reading it. It makes all the matter in the world. But your mind, you're not engaged with it. Your brain is turned if off. You're, you're just trying to pronounce correctly. I get it, but I think engaging with it, you're going to be a better reader. You're not reading you a You've got to engage book. it. Well, you've got to like, I've they you, just I've read. Ever, yep, I get it, but. You still, you're not like giving voices necessarily, but you certainly emphasize certain things. I think sure, that, being carried yeah, along true. with it is uh, is part of it. What? All right, that's the, when you the, fuck up. That's when they get you. The other that's two when you questions. Stu- stumble over a word. Go, go. The other two questions, as part of it, was which author would you be most excited to be asked by, and if you could pick any book of your choice to narrate, uh, which book would you choose? And that's what that's where I I thought about it in that way, and I would be excited. Uh, either way, I would be most excited to be asked by Sigrid Nunez. Actually, I, I've recommended a couple of her books lately, and she uh, is someone I feel connected to, just like a- having read all of her books. She's the only author I can think of lately that I've gone back and read everything. Have yeah, you gotten them all? I've read a few, but I, I think I'm now. All. I think I'm short one. Uh, and so I haven't been like recommending them all on recommendation station, but over the last year and a half, I've gone back and read almost everything. Some, some are definitely better than others, but I just love her as a person. And so if she uh, asked me, I would be just like, what a, what an honor. It would be weird too, because all of her narrators are women. So I'd be an a, out of left field. Choice. It would be an honor, but wouldn't it be pressure and having be someone that you looked up to and admired? You know, if because you, you're like I, you, I think you would hate it. You would learn to hate the book. You would hate no. her. You would hate reading. You're weird. It's it no. I think you don't understand how much time it takes. The one I've thought of, I would pick is uh, Werner Herzog's uh, The Twilight World that I read this year. Oh yeah, because the way it's written, it's like it would be quicker to read. I'd have more to do to make it like make it cool. But you want to hear his voice when you read that fucking book. So I don't know what I would do. Right? They said any book. The the first was the author you most be excited to be asked by. So I picked the living author. But any book, I would go. uh, the movie Gore by Walker Percy, just because like it, it has such a personal connection to me. I love that book. I named my son Walker partly after, and just like the vibe, it's pretty short. It's just like an easy going New Orleans searching vibe. I think that would be a fun book. I've read that so many times. I feel like I could do it. You want you? It sounds cool. It's not cool, and you'd rather read it than have to read it. It's also the book I've recommended to the most uh, amount of people, and almost no one is like, oh yeah, I love that book. Uh, I bought a copy. Up. I have not read it yet. I ha- I've had a copy for years after you recommended it to me, and I have never uh, never read it. Gilly likes it. Our friend Sarah Gilly. I heard from her this weekend. She saw I was in Chicago and reached out. Should, you should have hung out. She was in Texas. Yeah. I was only there for like 24 hours. Still. Mm-hmm. Be, a, be a friend. I haven't seen her in 15 years. Yeah, I haven't in about 11 or 12. It's one of, my, one of my best friends in the entire world, and we were living in New York together, blocks apart, seeing her all the time, no one I was closer to in New York, and then uh, she moved about six months before I did. That was 11 years ago. I haven't seen her once since. What's up with that? There was a wedding. No, we went to her wedding. That was, that was while we were still in New York. <laughs> okay. That was a long time ago. And now it's time for... Is it? No. <laughs> Is it? Oh, yeah. Now it's time for ad copy. I like that Aaron's like a dog that he doesn't listen to you. He's like, nope, you're not my master. <laughs> the hell, Aaron? Uh, Aaron, did you know there's over 2.4 million podcasts in the world? 
including the one you're producing right now. I record most of them. You d- you really do. You uh, are the man for many podcasts at All Things Comedy. It's an ad for Aaron. Uh, it takes a team of people to bring all these podcasts together. Aaron knows it. When they're looking uh, for people to hire at All Things Comedy, uh, whether it's like an audio engineer, editor, producer, assistant. So uh, decorator. They go to uh, ZipRecruiter. Needless to say, hiring the right people for these roles is important. Whether you're hiring for a podcast or for your growing business, there's only one place that makes it easy, ZipRecruiter. And now you can try it for free at ZipRecruiter.com slash JRVP. Uh, would you be a little worried, though, ZipRecruiter, Aaron, would do such a good job, they would replace you? They're looking for a new Aaron. Yeah. Powerful technology <laughs> to find uh, and match the right candidates to you. It's true. I mean, how many errands do you really need? Really, one is getting it done at All Things Comedy, so you wouldn't want to get a new one. I'd love a second errand. Okay. Uh, you can easily review uh, any recommended candidates. You invite your top choices to apply. Uh, there's a whole bunch of tools that makes it very easy to filter, review, rate your candidates. Uh, so if you're a fan of this podcast, you want to try ZipRecruiter for free today. Remember our URL, ZipRecruiter.com slash JRVP. Again, that's ZipRecruiter.com slash JRVP. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. Imagine doing that for eight hours <laughs> on a loop. I mean, I think people would like it. I, I like just like a eight hours full of pre-rolls. I would, oh, yeah. I would give you 10 grand to make you read a book. Just make you read it out loud on tape and send it to me just to make you do it. So you don't think ten grand's enough? Maybe twenty five. I don't know. We're showing our privilege here that we'd be asking asking for that much. You'll be in there and regretting that you that you said yes to it, no matter what the amount is. I don't think so. I mean, if you tell me that amount of money for ten hours worth of work, no matter what it is. But it, t- it does not ten hours of work. You're doing it for like for for a long time to get that ten hours. Okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't. I don't buy it. I don't think I would mind it. You're talking to someone uh, who has like nine podcasts a week now or something. If you include the TV shows and the podcast, combine them together, that's nine. Yeah, but you're just I talking. Don't... You're just talking. That's, that's fine. It's easier than reading. You know what's also uh, easy to read? What's that? Fun to read. A black buffalo ad. Uh, look, if you're over 21 and you dip or chew tobacco pouches or a long cut, you got to try out tobacco alternative black buffalo uh it's everything you love about dipping uh includes the pharmaceutical grade nicotine it does not have the tobacco leaf or stem it's made out of edible green leaves food grade ingredients uh also has the same aroma the pack the nicotine as all the traditional tobacco uh uh, products they deliver it to your house stop getting up and going to going to the gas station at two in the morning because you ran out it's a good point. You sit, they sell delivered. the products at blackbuffalo.com. Yeah, you can subscribe, uh, have it sent to you uh, just once, or you can make it a subscription service. It's got both long cut and pouches. And if you want a nicotine-free option, they have that. It's called Zero. Uh, it was born in the Midwest, raised in the South. That's my favorite part about Black Buffalo. Uh, they proudly manufacture all their products in the U.S. of A. These colors don't run. Uh they make small batch, by the way. Like uh, they made it in small quantities, small batch runs, so you can you can count on the best quality from Black Buffalo. We love that shit. Uh, I like the branding. You know, I, I like how it looks. I like the website. It's very uh, easy to use, professional. Uh, and again, if it's 2022, are, if you're still dipping traditional tobacco or those white portion things, and you're over 21, it's time to get with Black Buffalo. Everything you like about the dipping with dipping without the actual tobacco leaf or stem head to blackbuffalo.com use the promo code jrvp at checkout for 25 percent off your first order that's the best offer you'll find you have to use the code jrvp 25 percent off your first order one last time that's promo code jrvp off your first order and that was no oh, warning warning this product contains nicotine nicotine is an addictive chemical and that was ad copy. Let's get back to emails. <laughs> uh, the next one's for Matt. Hey, Greg and Anthony. A lot of uh, book uh, questions, so maybe we'll roll through these pretty quick. Uh, being the literary tastemakers you are, I'm curious what you think about the works of Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, I love his point of view on humanity. 
and how his humor permeates through his writing and which of his novels do you like best and why? Uh, love Kurt Vonnegut. I'm sure I speak for Greg. I once got him for his birthday uh, when we were in our birthday present arms race. I got you a first edition copy of, uh, of Breakfast of Champions. Um, that's certainly a favorite. Uh, I w- I'll still list- have that. By the way, that is like one of the best presents you can get, ever get anything is a cool first edition. Mm-hmm. I mean, how many gifts do I have that anyone gave me that are that old? Almost, virtually none. And I have that book. And buy, I, it I before, it. buy it before the author dies. That helps. Um, Breakfast of Champions, amazing. But I think my favorites, I, every, uh, uh, Slaughterhouse-Five is incredible. That's my first. I think a lot of people's first, Vonnegut. But my two favorites, and those are my top four, Breakfast of Champions and uh, Slaughterhouse-Five. I love Cat's Cradle and um, Mother Night. Okay. I like Mother Night. Uh, I didn't connect as much with with Cat's Cradle. I read that one. Yeah, I love Vonnegut. I, I like I, the idea of Cat's Cradle, like the 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 thing that gets in the water and everything's gonna. I like. I love he, he's brilliant because, as you see, sort of the ideas of his book, like what inspired him to write it, like the over is almost as good as the book itself. I mean, I bre- love his writing. Breakfast of Champions is is still my favorite. Uh, I liked his first book, Sirens of Titans. I remember. Mm-hmm. I, I like Player Piano. So th- those are a lot of the. The early ones. I did. He wrote a book uh, about writing. Uh, I think a man without a country. It was called, which I which I enjoyed. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he's one of those guys that like. Sometimes when I go back to the books, it doesn't hit the same as it did like when I was younger, and that's fine. Uh, like, what a great book for my honors English. Humble brag. Uh, you know, teacher to to include in the options of stuff we were reading junior or high school was Slaughterhouse Five. Like that's just such a great book to read uh, in high school and kind of even introduce you to that this could be a book, this, these sort of ideas and, and that much fun to read. Very funny, fun and, to read. And let's not forget the wad of used toilet paper that was Time Quake. Yeah, Time some, Quake of the, sucked. some of the later ones struggled. Uh, our next question is from Evan Carl. He says he's the chef who delivered barbecue to Largo. Fuck yeah. He's a huge NFL and stand-up comedy fan. You're one of his favorites, Anthony. He's going to ask uh, how I could feed both of you on your next podcast. He also wants to feed you uh, while touring. So I guess this is more of a private uh, question. He also wants to feed everyone at All Things Comedy, too. <laughs> I'm open to bringing food for the entire staff. I don't know about all everyone, uh, but maybe we should reach back out to Evan and, and hook the three of us up. Yeah. Aaron. I don't know. Aaron, do you like barbecue? Sure. And this is great. This guy uh, brought back barbecue to my last show. He does a question, show, by the way. But and yeah. it, was, uh, it was incredible. So I would totally eat this again. I would say, I don't know if All Things Comedy wants their address out there. I mean, we're not going to say it in the podcast. No. But I don't know if they, don't know if they want us to email him even to do that. We'll find out. But okay. we, I would gladly have them bring it here. I'm sure no one here would mind. Uh, as for shows, like when I'm at like Brea, uh, the show's around L.A., they're like an hour or so outside the city. Um, I would love to have uh, some barbecue there. Um, I, I would say I would say get in touch with the venue and uh, and just show mm. up. If you bring up a bunch of barbecue, uh, and maybe they would want me to they'd ask about it. You know what? Call the venue. Tell I, them, tell I them didn't think bring... this was going to be part of the whole thing. I just thought it was some nice color. Call, yeah. I love. Listen, if you bring me a, the the barbecue that this guy brought me. Like I'll I'll, re- I'll answer any question he has. It was so fucking good. Um, call the venue, tell them you have barbecue for me. You want to make sure if when you if you drop it off, it's gonna get to me. What what do you do? Like, they might call my manager. My manager will get in touch with me. I'll say yes. That's the way to keep the line of communication going. But I would love I would love. Do some you ask more for stuff on your rider for the, you know the first time in my life I have uh, that uh, you know. Mm-hmm. theater show coming up in london if you're listening to this there's like you listen to it on tuesday or wednesday you do have a day or two left to go get tickets and come see it. they had it they asked if we wanted a rider you know what did we want i didn't say anything i, I should have said yes food and no anything you want at all because they, they, they won't just get you food if you didn't say anything but if you're like i want even like uh Some sandwiches yeah is it, say sandwiches if you say i want I want French bread. I want like I want honey mustard. Like whatever you tell them, they will do for you, and you are paying for it. No, but I know. they will do it for you. And anything you might think you want, any kind of water you want, uh, if you want it cold, you want it regular, you want uh, a bottle of Coke, anything you want, you can get. But you have to you have to tell them. Yeah. I, I started out by being like I don't I don't care I'm cool, and then once I realized I would have all the things I would want or need, you know, it's it's the best. So yeah, list whatever. 
Okay. You got time. Okay. I, I know. I don't do well when I'm I don't when use I'm, a rider in hungry. comedy clubs. I'm hungry right now. I don't use a rider. In, I'm, I'm actually going to eat barbecue when I get home from the barbecue guy across the street. Dang. I, uh, <laughs> oh, fine. Let's keep moving. All right. Let's talk about uh, his question, by the way. He, uh, he, has, uh, he has a lit question. A lot of book questions in a row here. Uh, as much contemporary literature makes the choo-choo list. No one calls it the choo-choo list. I've heard it Evan, referred to as such. Evan Carl. You delicious uh, barbecue maker. Uh, he's curious to how you both dispose retain books when finished. Uh, you, you've mentioned buying some on release date. I imagine most of the reads are, are physical books, hardcover books. Do you, do you donate them to Goodwill? Do you retain them, give them to a bookish friend? I'm eager to hear you both discuss this. Okay. Uh, I keep the books I love mm -hmm. and or even like a lot. And... Um, I mostly just like put them in one of those give a book, take a books. Uh, otherwise. Yeah. I, uh, a similar, I don't, uh, I actually, I drink, read a lot of my Kindle these days cause I'm running out of shelf space. I only donate books like right after I read them or when I get them and I'm like, I hate, I don't want this. If it's embarrassing. If I'm like, I shouldn't have gotten this. I can't believe it's on my, sh on my shelf. I got to get rid of it. I don't want to see it anymore. I hated it so much, right? It's not what I thought it was going to be or someone gave it to me. I'll donate that right away. And then I just fill my shelves with them. And then every once in a while, I do a shelf perch. Yeah. Where it's like, it's been years. I'm like, you know what? I've got to make more room. And I go through and just box them up and go donate them at uh, out of the closet um, um, thrift, sh thrift store, um, Goodwill. I don't really, there's some of those places that you like take a book, leave a book, but I don't trust the, I don't trust it. I it's feel like true. it's just like, people, yeah, some people I think steal, it. steal books from there. Uh, yeah, or now you, you like most used bookstores aren't buying anymore post pandemic because mm -hmm. they just got too many. But if you have a used bookstore that you love, just give it. I just give it to them. Yeah, and I just give it. I wouldn't be like buy these from me. I'd be like, just right now, these. now they uh, they're not even buying a lot of the times. But I'm happy to have a place to go give uh, good books uh, and help out used bookstores. But uh, you keep the ones you like because uh, it feels good to be surrounded by them. And I do reread, especially I find during. Uh, the NFL season when my brain is just like a little fried. I do more rereading of, of older books that I just know is going to make me make me happy. All right. Next one is from Andrew. Question for you. In 2009, you were named one of Comedy Central's breakout comedians of the year. Alongside a ton of comedians you've mentioned are your friends or you've worked with in some capacity since. One I don't think I've ever heard you talk about is Donald Glover. Do you have any stories with or about him? What are your thoughts on his comedy TV show, uh, Childish Gambino, anything about him? Uh, I love Donald Glover. I don't know him very. I think I've spoken to him like twice in my entire life. Um, we were on that list together, but he was kind of like thrown in because he was just such a star all of a sudden. He wasn't really a stand-up. He would do stand-up sometimes, but he was way more of a, um, he was had like a sketch group that was amazing, a sketch and improv group, where he's one of the people that I saw. I remember being at the Del Close Marathon in New York, walking through the UCB Theater, on 26th Street, like walking downstairs, going to the green room. I was on like, the Late Show. I forget what I was even doing there, but uh, I saw him doing a skit where he's with like the other guys, and I think it was a sketch group called Derek. They all had names that started with D, and they, they weren't Derek, but they went by Derek. They made a movie at one point, uh, Mystery Team, I think, and uh, and they're all on stage together. They're all very funny, but Donald Glover stuck out stuck out so hard as like that guy's a fucking star. Hmm. Everything he did, every move he made, it was just, like that guy's a star. That I remembered him. And then he, he got on Community or something. Like, he was just coming up. Every time you saw him on camera, he became more famous because he was so good. And I don't remember much of his stand-up. I know, just know he didn't try that hard at it. Um, and I remember him being at the Montreal Comedy Festival and doing well. And then at the after party on the last night, got up and like rapped like three songs. And I was like, this is hilarious because every comic here fucking hates him. Like, why would you think that a room full of comedians who are like trying to like further their careers would want you to like to sit and watch you do two songs. It's not a it's not a hip hop like festival. It's a comedy festival, and you're like upstage. Because it's badass. Because you're like, wow, this guy not only uh, is as funny as us, but he just fucking wrapped his ass up. I'm sure people thought it was great, but I would the, the comedians were not. I was just like, <laughs> it's, I think this is funny. And then I remember when we were on that list, no one really knew Donald. All the people on there are like were friends of mine at the time, but Donald was like a, an outlier from New York, and uh, and they were trying to having trouble finding people to talk about him of the group of us. And they're like, dude, what do you have to say about Donald Glover? And I was like, I think he's hilarious, but I truly don't know him. Like, I don't have much to say about him, but I think he's like, he's brilliant. 
And they're like, well, did you know that he was, um, that he got hired to write on 30 Rock while he was still in college? And I go, well, hooray for affirmative action. And, <laughs> and, everybody, and everyone in the room laughs. Because I was like, why are you telling me? Like, what do I give a shit about this? And they use that Ugh. during his segment. Like, not like during mine, like me making fun of other people. But it's like, and now Donald Glover. And it's someone saying that and then me saying hooray for affirmative action. And I was humiliated. I was like, I can't believe I was just fucking around. And I could just see him with his family watching this and being like, what the fuck? Why are you slamming me? Uh, in my own like little segment, he, we never talked about it. Uh, I'm sure he wouldn't know who I was if he saw me today. But I think he's. I, I, I bet think he would great. know. He knows comedy, and he's like, "Oh yeah, there's that racist guy." I wonder if he still pays attention to to comedy. I've I've never watched Atlanta, but uh, I truly I do like Childish Gambino more than I ever thought I would. Atlanta's amazing. And, uh, Although, I know. Everyone you know, tells I, I kind of lost I lost track of it in season three a little bit, but uh, the first couple seasons are amazing. Everyone tells me that. I just haven't like sat down you would, to. You would get like into it. it. It's funny. But I think and, I think he's uh, great, and anything he does, well, I'm sure will be. Amazing. He was even a good like Lando Car- Carlissian, Car- what? Aaron, you know Star Calrissian. Wars. Calrissian, yes, in that Han Solo movie. Like he's he's awesome. He's the mo- one of those charismatic performers I've ever uh, hmm. been in a room with. It's high praise. Mm-hmm. Trying to get back in his uh, good <laughs> graces after your uh, bullshit joke. Okay. Uh, uh, this is a question mainly for Anthony, but Greg, by all means, let's hear your opinion too. Do you have any funny, awkward moments during a radio interview? I hear other comedians talk about how much of a nightmare they can be. So curious on your take. Yeah. I mean, I don't like doing it. I, it got a lot better for me after the Trump roast because then they had something to ask me. In the beginning, they're like, so what's your name? You're tall. It's like, it sucks. And you're supposed to bring up, excuse me, you're supposed to like bring the heat. But you're on some, and when you're starting out, you're on some bullshit radio show. It's not like you're on the good one anyway. And I, I truly hated it. And I felt really weird telling my jokes uh, to someone else. They were like, tell me a joke. Like, give me, give, what's your one of your newer jokes? Then I could like kind of do it because it's artifice. Yeah. But everyone else tries to work it into conversation. I remember being on this show called Bob and Tom. Have you ever heard of that? No. It was one of the biggest radio shows in the country, syndicated out of Indianapolis. And when you performed in Indianapolis, they had you on the show. And every, everyone would talk about it like it was like the Tonight Show. Like it was this huge deal. And then you go and you're there for like three hours. You get up in the morning and you're up all night the night before. You get up like Friday morning and you go and it sucks. I'm just hungover and tired. I haven't eaten anything. And uh, there for hours. And the guys would, uh, the guys would go, they were talking amongst themselves. And they go, Anthony, how's your dad? And I go, he's fine. <laughs> and they're like, all right, another thing in the news. And I'm like, oh, they wanted me to tell a joke. And because they'd be like, what do you have jokes about? I'm like, oh, my family, you know, like my girlfriend. And then when they would be like, so your, uh, is your girlfriend uh, visiting soon? And I'd be like, what? No, she lives in New Orleans. And they'd just be like, what is happening? And afterwards, I'd be like, oh. One time, I, I, I always say now if I have to do it, and I almost never do, but if I do, I say no, um, what do you call it, soccer mom stations, like the like variety hits of today, because I would do those in the morning, and they always went terribly. And I remember once going into one, and they're like, do you have any Harry Potter jokes? I'm like, no, man, I don't. <laughs> And then they sit me down and this older woman is, is the co-host and she's like, she's like, yeah, you know, I was, uh, I was talking to my mom the other day and I go, oh, I can't believe your mom's still alive. And, <laughs> and she just, she just stops and stares at me and goes, that's hurtful. And then interview <laughs> over, like I was gone, that I've had them get really awkward that's and bad, awesome. that now I just kind of... Hopefully they have like. Yeah, I feel like you don't really fit in that uh, scenario because even if you did answer uh, Tom and Bob the right way and like then gave your quest, you know, answer about your brother and did the Mikey masturbation joke, I mean, it doesn't really work in that no. in that context in that way. But if I did well and which happened on occasion, like if they were good DJs and they were kind of around my age and like were into me and like laughed at my jokes, then I, people would come to the show that night and be like, I, "You were great in the radio." But almost every time I'd be like, did anyone hear me on the radio and come to the show? And no one would say anything because wow. they, they would never, if they listened to it, I was bad. I've been there for three hours and not said a word on many, many a show. That's insane. Because I'm pissed I'm there for three hours. I, I've done a million of these sports radio hits, but almost never in person unless it's like Super Bowl week. And it's a weird, what? I just thought of a, a really, a, a one I'm still embarrassed about. What? I was doing... It was for the Trump roast. It was after you, the, the day the roast aired. They would make everyone who was on the roast get up and do like two hours of radio where it's like five minute. There is, there's an operator transferring you. He's on the line with you the Ugh. whole time, transferring you from, from thing to thing. And I'm just like, I'm over it. 
and it, no one really knew who I was yet. It was like a lot of like, like, so like, why are you on this? And this one, the, I get on this with these guys and they go, so first question, who are you? And I go, I'm one of the most exciting up and coming comedians in the country right now. <laughs> and, the, and the guy's just like, oh, um, uh, and then like the, the interview ends and before they hang up, I can hear him go, Jesus Christ. And I was like, yeah, that was uh. totally my bad. <laughs> totally my bad that I, I'm still embarrassed about it. I've had a lot of awkward uh, sports radio hits because the majority of them, they're just looking for you to fill, fill time. Mm -hmm. And it's just like 15 minutes. They're not listening to the answers. And they're just like, all right, so, you know, Co Colin Kaepernick's been benched. Uh, what do you think about that? You know, and like, in, like not engaging at all. And you realize quickly, like, to start saying no to most of these things. And, like, you're working for them, essentially. There was some idea that, like, you're going to get your name out there and it's promoting. It's like, no, you're, you're really just helping them out for the most part. But there are some ones that that you like the person and you end up having a relationship and you mm -hmm. have a good conversation. And so you're happy to help them out, uh, and, and do it. But I've had a couple where like they sandbag you where like a Boston radio one had me on and like I, without me knowing, and, and I, I learned this on Twitter after like, like they spent like the 15 minutes before I was on the show, like shitting on me and whatever like thing I wrote or that I did something wrong. And then they come, they have you on and they like kind of put you like, it's almost their stick that they're like, Hey, you know, yeah. almost put you uh, on the defensive and like try to come at after you. Or in my case, cause I work for the NFL, they'll just be like, so uh, Roger Goodell, like, uh, like, what a piece of shit, huh, man? And I'm just like, um, yeah, yeah, you know I work for the NFL. It's just like, what, what, what are you expecting out of me in, the, in this situation? So that, I, that's I've terrible. had those, too. I remember, like, I've had some that just, they, they want to they make you mad. They want to, like, make you flip out. And on the, on the phone, you can get me because I'm, I'm so not paying attention. And I'm like, I hate this so much. But if I'm in studio, I've had people try to, like, rile me up or, like, say something to me to try to make me mad. And I'm like... I don't give a flying fuck about this. Like I'm here yeah. for as long as I need to be so the club doesn't get mad and then I'm gone. But I've never gotten upset in person. And just to be clear, like Roger Goodell, really nice guy. Um, I don't know him that well personally, but like the people that work in the league office always have a lot of nice things. Our, our mutual friend, Colleen Wolf, just interviewed him uh, a couple weeks ago. It must and have been nice. It had a nice interview. Pick that brain. <laughs> nah, we got a couple more questions. Uh, this one's for me. How did you meet Emika? Sorry if that's too personal, but for as much as she's mentioned, I feel like the listeners don't m know much about her. I'm sure that's by design. See, Emika, we, I, don't, I don't give too much away. I think she thinks I give too, a lot away. And uh, her background as a professionally trained chef sounds interesting. I just read Kitchen Confidential by uh, Anthony Bourdain, so I'm all in on the chef life right now. That is a great book. Um, it, it tells the truth, which is that... Uh, cooks and kitchens are uh, full of badasses, of which Emika was, was one when she used to. She was not a cook when I met her. I met her in Tokyo. Uh, it's a little bit of a sore subject for Anthony, because uh, I was introduced uh, to her by one of my best friends, Dave. He was the best man at my wedding. Some might even say my best friend. Um, like, co you know, co-best friend. Got a couple best friends here. I'm godfather they're both kids. I got to not be the best man, but also give a speech where I referenced not being the best man. Used to be really a running uh, sore subject in the early days of the uh, Jessel, Nick, and Rosenthal Vanity Project. Jr. Junior, vice president. Um, but you can have multiple best friends. Anyways, Emika was, in, was a, a good friend of Dave's, and he was living in Japan for about three years as part of a teaching program there. He was about to come back to the States, and I, I went to visit him, and uh, I hung out with Emika there. Uh, we spent a couple weekends in Tokyo, me and Dave. He lived outside the town, and I met her there. Where's Dave's wife from? Um, Denver. Really? Yeah. But she's Japanese. No. No? No. Who am I thinking of? I mean, his, 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 her family is of Chinese origin. You're right. But she's from okay. uh, Denver and like New Jersey. Who am I thinking of? Yeah, that's who you're thinking of. Not Dave, but who's the other friend? Evan? Yeah. Evan, no, Evan didn't marry Japanese. No. But I feel like he went there to find a wife. I, but he didn't. He, he ended up marrying, uh, you know, he someone he then? knew before. He didn't meet her there? 
No. But she met her before. Did he date someone while he was there? He dated. I mean, we don't need to get into it. He <laughs> listens to this. Uh, he dated her in the States. He knew her and they had broken up. You know, they, they were off and on or whatever. But he knew her before all that. And yeah, she grew up. I, now I forget. They live in New Jersey now. But I think she grew up in Colorado. I should know this about. Um, I just remember you winter. went there to visit and you came back with a wife. Right. What does that have to do with anything? I didn't come back with a wife. We started dating long term there. We met up for the first time in LA. And this is she more had... romantic that you did not kiss the first time you met in Japan. You just you just talked. You were friends, and then you went back. She had a boyfriend while no. you. What I thought you... she had a boyfriend when you went. So nothing happened between you two. Nothing. And you went back and started emailing, and she broke yes. up with a boyfriend. No, she didn't have a boyfriend. There was maybe an interest. Uh, you, you're, you're on something there. but She was pregnant. God, why are we even talking about this? There was no... She was single. She terminated it when you, when you went back. She was single. We hung out. I, w- I was into her. I don't think she really uh, thought about it too much. I might have I tried to like give her a kiss goodbye, just saying goodnight. Like we, we had stayed out all night because you had to stay out until the first train back to where he lived which was like 6 a.m. So we, we spent a couple of weekends like hanging out in the same group, and I was definitely into her by the end of that. But it certainly wasn't anything that was voiced. Um, and then I mentioned it to Dave, and he was like, oh, really? Uh, and he was totally surprised uh, by that. And I think felt like, like, oh, really? Bad game. Gross. <laughs> well, no, but I just was like two friends. He's like, he, I didn't give it away. You didn't give a vibe. You weren't like trying yeah, to. It was, yeah, I wasn't really like doing any major uh, – moves there but yeah we started emailing we started skyping and uh i said you know uh suggested maybe we would meet up and she was like sure like let's do it in six weeks so it wasn't much uh it wasn't much time then we met up and uh spent a weekend in california and off we went and how many times because you would meet for like a week at a time yeah how many times did you see each other before you proposed i remember you proposed on the vineyard but like she came here a couple times to like the west coast because she had family there or something and then you would you would like yeah, visit me probably a total of like five times mm-hmm. over a year and a half. But five of those times were like a month in the summer. I we spent like a month together in New York two different times, mm. or a month plus, like four to six weeks in New York. And at the end of uh, that second sort of summer session, but it was it was only a little bit a year after we had met in the first place did, that I proposed. Did anyone think you were moving too fast? Like you didn't ask my, you, you weren't did. like, what do you think? I was just like, oh, okay. Uh, I think if I said anything, I was like, w- would you be doing this if it not for the distance and the, the green card of it all and like the visiting? It had like, nothing no. to do with the green card just the, of the it all. Just the ease of seeing each other. You know what I'm saying? Not, not the green card of it all, but just all that stuff that... Uh, no. I mean, it had to do with, by the end of the second summer, be, doing long distance is ridiculous, mm-hmm. much less New York to Tokyo lo- is ridiculous. And uh, by the end of the second summer, I had some clarity. It was relatively impulsive. Um, it was very impulsive, but I had clarity out of nowhere that either we should break up at the end of this trip or we should get engaged and i like asked her the next day i pretty much decided like it wasn't really on my mind and i just like uh i asked her the next day uh, to get engaged i didn't have a ring or anything at the time and she was very surprised i bought that day like a sort of a makeshift ring to as a placeholder did you get on one knee and say hey we should either break up or uh or get married i think she she probably was feeling the same thing it's too hard i mean we had skype yeah. and stuff but it, it was ridiculous yeah it's so i was like i i'm i'm not ready to do another year uh long distance uh like this uh but i definitely have i wasn't ready to break up i, I wanted to give it a shot and now, here we are i supported it 15 years later jury's still out <laughs> all right final question how have you and anthony uh, remain such good friends after all these years. I'm 24, and though many of my friends have remained relatively local, I definitely feel the drifting. How do you avoid that? It's Matthew. Well, you always keep wanting more. You know, that's why, I, you know, I, I bring up the best man thing, you know? It's just like you got you to gotta make Anthony feel like he hasn't totally earned it yet. You, you got to you tie your kids to me. <laughs> Um, no, I think I think similar interests, mutual respect. Sorry, that was a bullshit answer. Gen, gen, general, genuine inf- interest because like we were friends with a lot of people in college. We were the be- We were like we were tighter than other. We were with other people, but almost everyone's fallen away, and we've stayed the same because I just think we're interested in each other's lives without judgment. That I think uh, I think helps. But I'm happy to 
let everything go away. And if you didn't live here, I don't think we'd be as close as we are now. We we keep in touch more than I keep in touch with other people from that time of my life. Uh, well, we do but, a podcast together every week. Yeah, but I would still see you. I'm still Godfather to your kids. Yes, like, before I the for podcast, stuff. when we were living in LA, we still saw each other quite a bit. Mm-hmm. More than I see most people. Like, I see work people who are, who are all comedians, but I think we've we haven't like worked on staying like staying friends. It just it comes naturally to us. You like want to do the work. Yeah, there were periods where the, uh, there were a little bit less. Certainly, like. Because sure. we were younger, I was in New York, and and you were here. Although, I mean, it, it helps circumstantially that we're in LA together. That that's more than anything. And we were in New York together, so we've seen each other at different points of life. But what you said about judgment was my genuine answer that I thought when I first read this question. Um, we was like, I, I truly don't have judgment for my best friends, for for the few people that are really close in my life, and uh, I think that's important in terms of like remaining good friends for, for that long. Well, and I think, honestly, I was going to say uh, humor, too, because we would have text chains. We wouldn't email each other a lot, but we'd email each other funny shit. We'd be on, like, an email chain with a, with a guy, with Mike, and we'd, like, email, the, like, jokes back and forth sometimes. And that's, like, really fun. And instead of being like, how was your day? It's like, look at this fucking stupid joke that that, if you can have friends, you, you share the same sense of humor, then that is, uh, that's the way you keep in touch. Otherwise, I don't talk to anybody. Well, plus, like, there's a security in... Um I think we both know who we are a- as people, and if we didn't keep as close touch, and there were there were periods certainly where we were in different spots. It's like when you do talk or when you do see each other, you like just assume you're as good friends as you've always been. So when you say like drifting, I- I- I've been lucky to you know I have most of my close friends around me, or I do see them fairly often, but there there are certain. Uh, people that you only see so long, but like if you've had that bond with someone, like I don't know, there's no question that like you know who they are, they know who you are, and you get right back to it the second you see each other. I say let them drift, <laughs> let the bodies hit the floor. But you know what, Greg? I just thought of this: if you love something, set it free. <laughs> and if it comes back to you, it's Aaron. <laughs> so you don't think uh, you don't think me making Dave best man was like almost it was integral um, to us staying friends for so long because it was like you just you still felt like you know like you had a mountain to climb. I just wouldn't be one of those um, one of those many girlfriends over the years that you just got bored of after a while and discarded like uh, like an old book. I didn't give a fuck that you didn't make me your best man. I would have done it, happily done it, but it was, I was joking. still a groomsman. I'm joking. It was, it, was no, uh, it was no pressure, but yeah, I, I didn't. Uh, I don't know. I, what's wrong with me? Have you ever been a best man? Um, yeah, it was Dave's best man. I've never been a best man. I thought either, when I, I thought maybe you would make me a best man or my brother would make me a best man. My brother, did, I missed out by a hair and uh, on your wedding and my brother did not have a wedding. Well, to right. It. It, to be clear, it th- it's a silly thing, and I I don't even know if I would have done it the same because that the whole idea of like you have to choose one now seems um, antiquated or silly to me. But um, you know, it's like it was really a t- you know, he, Dave was my friend from growing up. You're you're my best friend uh, from college and moving on. But he introduced me to Emika. I got and it. She knew Dave, so it just felt like. Well, that's the tiebreaker. He's the one that introduced me, so uh, there yeah, you go. It would have been funny. likes him better. If you would have been funny, if you had been like, uh, "I'm going to make Dave my best man," I just don't like you that much. <laughs> it is a silly. It is a silly thing. I did make a speech at at my friend Evan had a party, uh, but two of us gave speeches, and there was no best man. They did the thing where they got married separately mm-hmm. and then had a party that cost more money than my wedding, mm-hmm. uh, which is like a modern thing that people do, which seems seems silly. It seems like because it. I guess because it was, but it was just like a wedding. There was mm-hmm. no difference. Yeah, there's just less pressure. It's like a more of a chill, okay. casual okay. thing. I, I get it. I, I shouldn't I don't be know. judgmental. Um, yeah, I, I gave a speech at your wedding. Yeah. It was uh, it brought the house down. Yeah, I don't know. You had did you have a microphone? Yes, the DJ gave me his microphone. It was like it was a little strange. It was in the corner. It was like uh, and that the whole wedding wasn't there at that point because it had gotten to like the dancing portion. People mm-hmm. had been drinking. It wasn't like in the speech giving no. uh, section. And then yeah, you you tore me apart. Yeah, broke it down. 
tore us apart. DJ, DJ love me. I've made I'm, I've made some I've made some mistakes over but, the years. Will, will you promise me that I'm the best man at your next wedding? <laughs> when this all falls apart, why can I be the guy? I w- I would. Dave love, was a jinx. Love, no, he was a jinx. If I if there's a second one, maybe she dies. Maybe it's not like a sad story where you guys get divorced. Maybe she dies and you got to find someone to take care of the kids, full house style, and you you go back to Japan. I mean, the the most offensive thing <laughs> that you've said in all of this um, was that Dave found his wife in Japan and that she was Japanese, and that's that was I found nothing that, wrong. With I that. found that offensive. They met in Boston. They met in Boston. And uh, she's either from uh, Colorado or New Jersey. But it, one but, of those two. But in and my defense, she's not Japanese. In my, but she is Asian. Yeah, but that's. I yeah, don't know her. Yeah, but like, that's offensive to just just paint paint uh, all Asians with the same brush. I here. just remember when you watch. I don't paint all Asians with the same brush, but all white guys with Asian girlfriends. You don't need you don't need more than one brush. I'll say that. <laughs> I'll say that. I think you do. Although it is it is. Uh, I don't know. There is some. There is some level of like if it's like a group of. It, you want you want more diversity. You know you want you want the couples to be mixed up in different ways. You don't just want a bunch of couples exactly like that. Mm-hmm. Why are you staring at me like that? I'm waiting for the episode to be over. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're the one that uh, that has to call for it. It's Walker. It's the email special episode, and we love all of you for listening in. That's. Our new clothes. <laughs> I mean, what were you looking for? Are you hitting the button? Walker, get us out of here. Whoa, Nelly, for Tonto. That's a spicy meatball.